Recently, Kathy Wood and analysts from ARK Invest have shared a lot of fresh insights on Palantir, ticker symbol PLTR. Palantir has quickly become one of ARK Invest's biggest holdings, weighing in at just under a billion dollars across all of their funds combined. It's also one of only two stocks that Kathy Wood has put inside all six of ARK Invest's funds, with the other being UiPath, ticker symbol PATH. In this episode, I want to add a little context to a clip from Dave Lee's recent interview with Will Summerlin, an ARK Invest analyst who focuses on artificial intelligence and software as a service, as well as Frank Downing, who focuses on cloud computing, software as a service, and crypto assets. The goal of this episode is to showcase Palantir's versatility as an artificial intelligence and data analytics company, as well as highlight how they're using their growing moat on the government side to power their down market expansion on the commercial side and vice versa. Because your time is valuable, I've edited these clips down to just the essentials, and timestamps are enabled for your convenience in case you want to skip the clips altogether and go straight to my analysis. Let's start with the clip of Will Summerlin talking to Dave Lee about ARK Invest's thesis on Palantir. I want to um, ask you about Palantir. So I know ARK, you guys have been you know, buying some Palantir, and ha- have you been able to, I don't know, um, evolve some thinking and where do you current where do you currently stand on for example their ai expertise their defensible let's say mode or advantage and like you know their uh, projections to grow revenue let's say even 50 percent or more per year for the next five years yeah it's it's a great question um you know i think there, there are a couple trends that i think are interesting with palantir uh you know they got a, a tailwind from COVID with government contracts and I think as we started to exit COVID, and you know, I guess you could argue now start to re-enter COVID to a degree, um, you know, that tailwind hasn't slowed down in the sense that while maybe their core contracts related to COVID are running up, um, we see you know government agencies, both federal, state, uh, across the world, reintroducing Palantir to solve other problems within their their agency. And so I think for for government side of Palantir. I think COVID was actually a great beachhead into many organizations and agencies across the world that they wouldn't have worked with otherwise or would have worked with much later in their their life cycle. Um, And so I I think there's a strong tailwind of sort of government adoption in that sense. And I think from an enterprise perspective, uh, you know, they gave an example in their last earnings call uh, where, uh, you know, Boeing actually switched to a a joint venture software platform of Palantir and Airbus away from something that they home grew with Microsoft. I think that's a great sort of indication as to what's happening across the board with enterprises when it comes to Palantir. You know, often they're competing with a homegrown solution. Um, you know, in many cases, it's Palantir versus, hey, let's build this platform ourselves. Uh, and, you know, there are certain advantages to doing both, but it seems like the 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 choice is tipping towards Palantir in, in many cases. And we think that's going to continue. Also interesting is the sort of move down market in the activity with SPAC investments. And their thesis around this is, hey, you know, we're going to invest in a company early in its life cycle, get them to build their company on top of our platform, and then we'll grow with them. Um, you know, and, and I think this sort of organic story of, hey, we're going to be the platform that helps a company build their first product or build a series of products and then grow with that company is really interesting. We saw that with Twilio, um, you know, for a long time. That's what drove Twilio's growth is these, you know, companies like Uber we use them very early on to actually build their technology, to build their product. And then, you know, Twilio benefit in that they grew with Uber. Um, and, you know, to me, Palantir is interesting in that that's sort of a new customer demographic um, where I think there's a lot of greenfield opportunity. You have the government sector, which we just talked about, that has that kind of tailwind continuing. And then you also have the traditional enterprise. You know, Palantir started uh, in the commercial side with big enterprises, right? Selling $10 million contracts to, you know, giant companies. And I think that's continuing. Um, you know, and I think companies are acquiring more data than ever. Um, you know, they need to start to layer AI on top of all of their, uh, you know, all of their 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 processes in order to stay competitive. And I think Palantir has sort of been an advantage position to help those companies through that transition. Uh, so overall, yeah, I think it's uh, it's an interesting story. Um, you know, given all of that, and given sort of the the head start that they had many many years ago with the government. Um, I think it'll be an interesting story over the next 
five or 10 years. So first off, a big shout out to the YouTube channel Palantir Vision, who also covered this clip a few days ago and made me aware of its existence. If you're interested in keeping up with all things Palantir, I'll leave a link to that channel in the description below, along with Dave Lee's full interview with Will Summerlin and Frank Downing. I think Will Summerlin did an excellent job highlighting two important things about Palantir that apply everywhere, from giant government contracts down to small and medium-sized businesses. Those two things are that every company today is operating in an increasingly data-rich environment and that Palantir is often competing with homegrown solutions. I worked on a lot of government projects during my eight years at MIT, so let me shed some light on why I think Will Summerlin's commentary on Palantir is so spot on. A lot of government projects are about generating unusual insights or processing unusual data sets, like data that comes from specialized sensors and systems, for example, radar and satellites. Not everyone has access to that data, so not everyone can really help with that data processing. Other times, the data itself might not be unusual, but the conclusions you're trying to draw from it could be. For example, can we process Google Earth data to somehow sniff out networks of bad guys? Even though everyone has access to Google Earth, systematically sniffing out bad guys is the job of a small pool of organizations, and how they go about doing that should obviously be kept under wraps. As the world becomes more and more data rich, more and more companies are trying to generate more of these unusual insights from more specialized types of data. To do that successfully, they often have to build their own solutions. That's how these two ideas are connected, and that's the space that Palantir operates in. The next point Will Summerlin makes is that companies are increasingly choosing Palantir over building their own homegrown solutions, sometimes even after their own solution already exists. Like how Boeing switched away from something they homebrewed with Microsoft to a joint venture platform built with Palantir and Airbus. Why do you think they would ever do that? Well, have a listen to this quick clip on Palantir from Kathy Wood's recent interview with Bloomberg Businessweek, and then I'll explain how everything fits together. Have Kathy talk oh. about, about Palantir and, and her recent buy. We believe that Palantir has the opportunity to usurp a lot of AWS, Azure, hmm. uh, Google Compute uh, over time. It is pushing... Uh, artificial intelligence out to the edge. And Palantir, because I think it's roughly 60% of its business has been with the government, much of that in intelligence agencies, Palantir is using technologies that we will find out about five years from now. They, we believe, are so far ahead because of their expertise uh, uh, in intelligence uh, that um, it's going to accrue to the company's benefit in the commercial space as well. So they've entered, I think, a year ago, 85% of their business was with the government. Today, it's closer to 60%. Uh, and so we've got um, all of the commercial uh, side to go. So uh, I, I don't think people understand how advanced Palantir is technologically mm -hmm. and how it's platform technologies pushing A out to the edge are going to really take share over time from the more centralized services. It's interesting that we're thinking about them that way now in the cloud. So the reason to go with Palantir over other software companies is because they're able to push AI out to the edge, meaning processing the data right where it's generated instead of having to move it off site or store it on the cloud. That's exactly what allows Palantir to work with intelligence agencies in the first place. They bring the data aggregation, transformation, interpretation, and visualization to the source, instead of making their clients make concessions to use Palantir. The reason to go with Palantir over homegrown solutions is twofold. First, Palantir now has a lot of pre-built use cases that come ready to use and get the client maybe 75% of the way to the solution they need fairly quickly. Oh, you're working with airborne camera data? No problem. We've worked with that before, so we can at least stand up the basics, the data handling, the geolocation, basic feature recognition, and so on. The second reason to go with Palantir over homegrown solutions is because as technologies and programming languages change or companies lose key personnel, their own solutions become obsolete, especially if they're only used on one or two small programs within an agency. When Palantir makes updates to the models and the toolkits and the technologies inside their Gotham, Foundry, and Apollo platforms, those changes are paid for by and to the benefit of many organizations at once. 
meaning that they're much less likely to go obsolete because any one program office gets its budget cut. That's what lets them stay about five years ahead of their competition, which isn't able to get these kinds of contracts in the first place and start learning about all the techniques and data that the government is using today. And the private sector won't see that until a few years from now. Don't forget, almost every foundational technology we rely on, from the computer to the internet to GPS, started out in the government. The other two points that Will Summerlin makes are about Palantir moving down market through their SPAC investments as well as being able to apply their lessons learned to traditional enterprise companies. Let me show you one of Palantir's recent SPAC investments that I feel really brings this point home. Black Sky is a company that runs its own constellation of satellites to image locations around the world multiple times per day. They now trade under the ticker symbol BKSY after their successful SPAC merger with Osprey Technology Acquisition Corp that completed just a couple days ago. Black Sky collect and analyze satellite imagery around the world to do things like secure seaports and airports, track progress of construction sites, measure stockpiles of materials in industrial zones, assess damage done by natural or man-made disasters, and things like that. Think about how many different types of companies could benefit from that kind of data whether they're building stuff, moving stuff, storing stuff, or just want to send notifications to different areas depending on what they see is happening there. Well, on August 31st, Palantir has committed to making an equity investment in Black Sky, following the successful completion of a joint pilot program that they ran together. Through this pilot project, Black Sky automatically delivered insights and intelligence to Palantir customers within minutes of collection, without any human interaction. The ability to deliver worldwide intelligence that can inform proactive strategic decision making introduces a significant advantage to time sensitive operations, like the security and logistics ones I just mentioned. To extend the benefits demonstrated by the pilot project, Black Sky also entered into a multi year software subscription agreement with Palantir to access Palantir Foundry. Here's a quote from Brian O'Toole, Black Sky's CEO. This collaboration further enables Black Sky to put the power of real-time intelligence in the hands of the user by allowing Palantir customers to directly task our satellites, reduce decision-making timelines, and increase the delivery of on-demand insights, and with our partnership with Palantir, we'll be able to accelerate our go-to-market plan, expanding our pipeline of commercial and government customers around the world. So not only does Palantir benefit from Black Sky's accelerated growth from building on top of Foundry, but Palantir also gets to learn about how to pipeline and process all of Black Sky's satellite data for commercial applications. Remember the Google Earth example I mentioned earlier? Well, it's not a stretch to imagine that one day, we'll all have access to really high quality, real-time satellite imagery of the entire world, just like we have access to GPS in Google Earth today. You can already use Google Earth for a wide variety of commercial services, from navigation to reviews to historic tours and just plain digital exploration. Imagine what kind of new applications could be built on top of a real-time view of the entire world. Applications for logistics planning and execution, helping emergency services, really good weather detection, and so on. And since many surveillance satellites today are government assets, guess who's already five years ahead on working with that kind of data? That's the big moat and key advantage that Kathy Wood and ARK Invest's analysts are talking about. I know it's hard to understand what Palantir does exactly, especially since many of the things they work on aren't part of our daily lives today. I think that satellite imagery is a great example since it used to be basically government only before Google and Garmin and other big tech companies really unlocked it for everyone, but in low resolutions and at slow update rates that have been getting better and faster over time. So hopefully this episode provided some clarity on how Palantir's work with the government and their investments in high-tech SPACs like Black Sky are allowing them access to the future versions of those same kinds of use cases, as well as those data sets before many of their competitors and before those use cases become commercially mainstream. If you're interested in seeing some of the other crazy futuristic companies that Palantir is invested in, I made an episode showcasing 12 of their other SPAC investments, each of which could offer clues about future use cases like the ones I just covered. I'll leave a link to that in the top right hand corner of your screen right now and in the description below as well. Until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.